so good day. Um, I wanted to bring to your attention the articles written by Joe Serburn, who lived from 1945 to 2010 when he died of kidney failure, similar to somebody else I know by the name of Pastor Pete Peters and also Wolfgang Mozart. This is a very, 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 very cogent article, and Joe Serburn was a very erudite, intelligent, and chilling author and speaker who took on the establishment and lost. As somebody said in one of the many obituaries written about Joe Serburn, whose name was Michael Joseph Serburn, said that um, Joe Serburn sacrificed a stunning career on the altar of truth. War and dramaturgy. Lately, I've been watching some old Alfred Hitchcock movies for the umpteenth time, particularly Vertigo and North by Northwest. And what splendid films they are, combining suspense, romance, and polish. One obvious object that objection to them is that their plots are so full of improbabilities. The more you watch them, the more you notice this. They weren't meant for repeated viewing on home video by a cranky old pedant. They were meant for the big screen in a crowded theater where the audience came to share thrills, not to take notes. Hitchcock had a gift for sweeping the audience along with absorbing action. I suspect that the improbabilities were conscious. The old man had a mischievous humor, and he liked to see how much he could get away with. It was a test of his virtuosity. Like a magician, Hitchcock kept the audience so preoccupied with the illusion that they forgot all about logic. His tricks pass unobserved until you go looking for them. In a similar way, though less adroitly, the Bush administration has tricked us into war with successive distractions. Renewed war on Iraq was planned long ago. The audience, the American people, had no inkling of this. They were caught up in the plot twists. The 9-11 terrorist attacks made them receptive to any retaliation. The American public applauded the initial strikes on Afghanistan, which were plausibly related to a war on terrorism. With this emotional momentum, the administration charged that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction which might be given to terrorists. The suspense built. The dramatic climax beckoned. Anti-war protests like critics' cavils only seemed to get in the way of the plot. On with the show. For months, the critics demanded proof of the weapons of mass destruction, of links with terrorist groups. The administration insisted that both were real, but offered only repetitious <clears throat> repetitious allegations with dubious evidence. When Iraq failed to produce and surrender the WMDs, the administration accused it of defying the United Nations, even when it seemed to be cooperating with UN in inspectors. Still, the administration set a deadline for war and the public expected more action. Now, the announced purpose of the war was to liberate Iraq as a step toward bringing democracy to the entire Middle East. The WMDs seemed to fade in importance. Added to the mix were stories about Saddam Hussein's atrocities against his own subjects, similar to what we're hearing today about Putin. These had nothing to do with the defense of the United States. But as Hitchcock knew, a good story is only as good as its villain. 
make the audience hate him, and they will believe anything. A military attack would dissipate the sense of confusion by distracting the attention from the flaws in the logic. The public had forgotten all about al-Qaeda and terrorism. Saddam Hussein had long since replaced Osama bin Laden as the villain on the front pages of newspapers and the covers of magazines. It was effective drama. All that mattered now was an epic military victory, and it came quickly. Victory was a sufficient climax made all the sweeter by crowds of Iraqis cheering the American troops. Never mind the original purpose of crushing terrorism, destroying the Iraqi army and toppling the new substitute villain was enough for the distracted audience. And those weapons of mass destruction, they were never found. They didn't even appear when Saddam Hussein's regime and his very life were at stake. In order to tie up this very loose end in the plot, the administration maintains that they are still there somewhere. Apparently, Hussein had hidden them so well that even he couldn't find them in time to save his own skin. In the media age, even more than ever, government is a form of mass entertainment. The trick is to control the audience's mood and attention, to distract their minds from inconsistencies and improbabilities and even from yesterday's official line. Polls, images, ratings, focus groups, and ultimately election results, these are the things that count, not principles and constitutions. Yet behind all the short-term, short-sighted purposes and slogans, a larger historical pattern is visible, of which the administration, captivated by its own dramaturgy, is barely aware. The great wars of 1914 to 1989 can be seen as a single gigantic struggle for global supremacy, ending in an American victory. Now, we are in a period of smaller wars of consolidation of the American empire. That, not terrorism or democracy, is what the Iraq War was really about. And this was written by Joseph Sobran. And the title, again, is War and Dramaturgy. And what I find so interesting about this is also the parallel that can be drawn um, with regard to the Hocus Pocus on TV with the fact that the lying scribes and wonders have changed scripture also to suit their slant that the Jews are the chosen people. All the while knowing that Jew is a made-up term to cover up, mask and hide the true identity of Esau, who still hates his brother Jacob Israel and go, is still going after him perpetually with a sword. <laughs>